Good morning. State Senator Bob Guida, uh, this is a meeting of the Ways and Means Committee, and I'm going to do the required um, right to know script. Today, we'll be holding a meeting of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Before we get started, I'll read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We're utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting, all members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We're providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remote Senate, one word, remote Senate at leg, L -E -G dot state dot NH dot US or call 603-271-6931. It's 271-6931. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states his presence or her presence, please also state where they are. And if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law, I will call the roll. Senator D'Alessandro. Senator Daniels. Senator Gary Daniels, I'm here in the Senate chambers. Senator Hennessy. Good morning, Aaron Hennessy from Littleton. I'm in the Senate chambers. Senator Rosenwald. Good morning, Cindy Rosenwald from Nashua here in the Senate chamber. And I'm Senator Bob Guida, also present in the Senate chamber. Uh, if you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And with that, um, we will begin our meeting. And I believe that we're going to have health and human services presentation first. And who do we have presenting today? Um, we have Karen Rounds and Meredith Tellis, so I will bring them in now. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Meredith Tellis. I'm the Director of the Division of Program Quality and Integrity at the department. And I am presenting uh, the revenues on behalf of the department because some of the revenues that you see here, um, a handful of them is collected within the division in our Bureau of Program Integrity. So um, Sonia, I did provide a handout. Would it make sense for me to pull it up now or discuss it later? I can do that. Okay. Let's see if I can find that. Okay, so can folks see the handout? Excellent. So I, this is not how you ever wanna start a presentation, but I found out just moments ago that um, 
The first chart you see here is comparing our unrestricted revenue budget to our unrestricted revenue actual revenues um, by year going back to 2016. Uh, after I looked at 20 and 21 on this chart, I had some concerns that this might not be the right numbers. These might be outdated. We had two different people pulling data, and I'm afraid one of them used an outdated number. I'm just confirming that, and hopefully I'll be able to tell you while we're still on this call whether that's the case. But what it would be is that these numbers, and I'm going to try to highlight them for 20 and 21. Can you see it when I highlight it like that? So if you can just not, you can see that. Okay, um, these numbers would be slightly lower is what it would be. They, they might be more like 4.5. I'm just trying to confirm that. So, I, and I will certainly let you know, we will revise the chart and we will send you the revised version as soon as we get that information. But I'm gonna start really with some background, um, trying to explain this chart and the variance between the budget and actual. And then in doing so, we'll move down to uh, this area where you can see our, our unrestricted revenue by each source. And we'll talk about the 2021 current revenue and, and projections to come through 2021 and what we anticipate for 22 and 23 as well. So you can see in the you know, current era history, I guess, the department's never been a huge component of the state's unrestricted revenue sources, but over the last five years or so, they've declined further and we're projecting slight further declines, but generally um, our revenues at DHHS are starting to level out and we anticipate they're going to be uh, between probably four million and four and a half million going forward. I don't anticipate seeing a lot of change uh, in the future years. Uh, it's, it's inconsistent though, not every revenue source is declining. Some are staying stable, some are even going up a little bit. So we'll go over them in turn and I can show you that. Um, I can show you that down here. You can see the revenues by sources. So this right here, this large blue line is is called in our other revenues, regular care. And it's really comprised of a lot of Medicaid revenues. So in particular, what happened here, this very large decline that you see, and it also explains the variance right here between these two lines, is largely related to our cost settlements with hospitals, our Medicaid cost settlements. So what are cost settlements? The, the department pays hospitals for outpatient services on a percentage of their costs. So we make an interim payment and then those hospitals are audited and then we do a revised payment based on their audited numbers. That usually results in what has been an overpayment from the state to the hospitals and the hospitals have to pay us back. So um, in 16 and 17, what had happened was um, a lot of hospitals had not completed their audits. They were in dispute with CMS over part of a rule around what, what can be counted for costs. Once that was resolved, a slew of audits got done and a lot of revenue came into the state and that's 16, 17. So we knew 18 and 19 would be lower because those audits were completed, the cost settlements were done. We knew 18 and 19 would be lower. However, unfortunately, um, in 18 and 19, the department during the budget phase had double counted the revenue that we anticipated from that one revenue source, just from that one revenue source, um, which resulted in a, a much higher estimate than what we were going to receive for those cost settlements. And at the time, we, um, as soon as we realized that it happened, I think we sent a letter to Senate Ways and Means, House Ways and Means, um, but my memory is that the actual budget for cost settlements in the years 18, 19 was going to be more like three or four million, and we had had double counted that. Um, so that explains this large variance. It was both a double counting of the budget and an amount that we knew would be going down because again, those audits had been completed, all the settlements took place, and then our our cost settlement amounts were becoming more normalized. However, our revenue has from this 6.2 number, our revenue has continued to decline and we anticipate it will keep going down slightly. And you'll see that here in this line, in the blue line, this is kind of our Medicaid revenues right here going way down. 
and then up a little bit and then down further. And that's partly also because of um, our, our program integrity function, which historically has been responsible for recoupments from providers, for overpayments from providers. As our Medicaid population has moved out of fee-for-service and into managed care, our managed care organizations are responsible for doing the program integrity for overpayments, so they recoup those. So what we get on the state side has been going down as our fee-for-service population has been going down. So that changed um, significantly at the start of 2019 with next day enrollment, our fee-for-service population shrunk. It's gone up recently um, with the um, um, COVID testing population and the fact that we can't terminate um, during the, we can't terminate Medicaid during the public health emergency. So it's gone up, but we anticipate it will, it will decline again. And then our program integrity, integrity revenues would be down. Um, another area of decline is this yellow line, which is third party revenues, regular care. I don't know if you can see, but overall over time, it's up and down a little bit, but it's really going down. And we anticipate it will decline further over the next two years. And that is where um, we do recoupments from other health insurance, where someone has Medicaid and another form of insurance, either Medicare or private carrier. And we realize Medicaid paid when we shouldn't have, and we go recoup from those other carriers or recoup from the provider. Similar to program integrity, as our population has been entering managed care, the managed care organizations are responsible for doing those recoveries. So we only do it on the fee-for-service population and necessarily that's going to be a much smaller revenue number. So the um, TPL amount has also declined slightly. The areas that are really staying pretty stable or even were, had been increasing slightly are our um, estate recoveries, which is the purple line that you see here, Medicaid estate recoveries, and that came in at about 1.5 and it's budgeted at about 1.5 in both years going forward. Um, we really have a very well-trained, well-operating group of people working in estate recoveries right now. So we think that this is gonna stay very stable. Uh, it, it's a little hard to predict because you never know when you're gonna settle a giant estate. So it can bounce up and down in certain years, but generally that one we anticipate being pretty stable. And the other one is restaurant fees. Restaurant fees are the, this green line right here, which is uh, about 1.2 million. It's increased very slightly over the last few years. But that we also anticipate um, staying stable in that we have budgeted it at about 1.2 million in each year going forward. Whether that's going to be the case due to COVID, whether um, you know, there's going to be a decline in the restaurant industry generally and it could impact our revenues, uh, we didn't make any anticipation for that. So those are the revenue sources. I just, I wanna show you the next couple pages are really descriptions for your reference. So this goes through the components of each of the revenue sources. And then there's one, this other source, other revenue sources, which is a number of things grouped together. And those are described down here. If you'd like to drill into each of those, it's a number of components together. And put together, that is the bulk of our, um, of our revenues. Again, going forward, we anticipate slight decreases, but um, we're not making any changes to these estimates at this time. This 4.3 million for 2022 and 4.2 million for 2023 are still the department's revenue estimates going forward. And I think we did have a couple specific questions uh, from Chris Shea before we started the presentation about Medicaid recoveries in particular. And those we anticipate um, this year, it's, it's estimated to come in at about 3.3 million. And that's really still our estimate. Um, I think that for this year, we might be down about 250,000 overall from our revenue estimate, but um, that's, that's the bulk of the change there. Um, so it would still come in pretty much at the same amount. And for the next two years for Medicaid revenues in particular, 
we would make no change to those estimates. It would still be 2.7 million for 2022 and 2.5 million for 2023. And I believe there was another question related to the liquor transfer request for Granite Advantage and Karen Rounds is gonna be able to help you with that. Good morning. Uh, the As far as the liquor transfer request for 22-23, what I can do is send the uh, committee some follow-up information from uh, Director Henry Lippman, uh, which we've already provided to other areas of the Senate so that uh, we keep everything consistent. The transfer for 21 was about $8 million. Um, the biggest impact to this, of course, being the public health emergency and not being able to disenroll anyone. Uh, so the impacts of 22-23 really depend on how long the public health emergency is in place for. Um, but I will get you that follow-up information that we've uh, provided, like I said, to others. All right, are there any questions from members of the committee? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Where do the um, drug rebates go? Are they unrestricted or do they just go back into the Medicaid program? They are a restricted revenue, so they go back into the Medicaid program. So they are in standard Medicaid, they're in the CHIP account, and they're also budgeted and granted advantage. Follow up, please. Please. Has the department ever considered trying to jointly purchase pharmaceuticals with the state employee health programs? I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I could chat with Henry about that. I, our fee for service population is fairly small at this point. So it's really the MCOs that are doing the, um, the drug purchasing, uh, but I could bring that question to Henry if you'd like. And one more follow-up, if I could. Yes. Um, do our contracts with the MCOs allow them to keep the drug rebates, or are we getting them? We get them. Okay, thank you. Further questions from the committee? I do have a question. Um, we hear instances of Medicaid fraud around the other states in the country. Uh, can you brief us on you know, do we have it? How frequent? What's the, you know, what, how much that type of thing? Just gives kind of a quick briefing on that. We do have it. Um, it's, it's not, you see headlines, you know, Texas doctors or Texas, some Texas practice, you know, um, $18 million worth of fraud, that type of thing. That's not what we find. Uh, but we do we do find instances, and in recent years, our Medicaid fraud control unit in the Department of Justice um, has seen some turnover. It was a little hard to get some of our cases up and off the ground, and that has changed. Um, so their staff has been very stable lately. We've been working very, very closely with them. We've also, in the department over the last four years, you know, really built up our relationships with the MCOs and our, because they hold the bulk of this population now, we've built up our expectations of what we want to see from them as far as um, uh, fraud reviews. The bulk of what we have for Medicaid is overpayments. It's not fraud. It's waste. Um, it's, you know, it might fall into a category you'd refer to as sloppy billing. That's the vast majority of what we see. And it requires technical assistance to the providers, clear direction to them. No, we don't want you to bill like that. We want you to bill like this. Um, we want you to document things this way. So that's absolutely the vast majority. But, you know, we do find instances of fraud and within the last probably um, four or five months, the Mafuku has made arrests to a, uh, an organization in Maine and another one in Massachusetts because of our reviews. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Senator D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you got to light right off adjustments. What are, what are these right off adjustments? Do they account for uh, a significant uh, loss of revenue? 
I want to make sure I'm looking at what you're looking at, Senator, um, down at the bottom of the of the chart. I see it now. That I'm not 100% sure with what the write-off adjustments are. I'm going to have to look into that and I'll be able to answer it for you. I, I would assume it's revenue we had been anticipating in the year or a prior year and realized was not going to be um, coming in. I'm, ju I'm just not sure exactly which revenue source, okay, but I can certainly check on that and follow up. Great. Uh, th those numbers are pretty big. Right. Yeah, I'm not, and they may be compared to the revenue source that is being referred to, but I'd have to look at that, or it could be for more than one. I'm not right. sure. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Okay, so we'll look to hear back on that then. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much. Se thank Senator, you. if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, the I have received word that the chart that you have received is accurate. So I don't need to revise the budget numbers and I will not be sending uh, an additional handout. Okay, thanks very much. For the clarification. Thank you very much for Thank your time. You. All right. All right, so we'll conclude that <clears throat> and we will move into DRA if they're available. They are. Look at the numbers. That they're projecting. Yeah, yeah. One percent of a big number. Oh no! I just turned off my camera. Just um, reconnecting. Hold this for a moment. It, 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 it. These, these blanks here are the recoveries, long term yeah. care, oh. radiation fees. So, oh, okay. good morning. Right. No numbers. It's been it's said that technology, technology is a wonderful servant. servant. But a terrible master, and I'm living proof of that. So thanks for your patience. Commissioner and uh, Melissa, welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Lindsay Stepp, Commissioner at the New Hampshire Department of Revenue. With me, Melissa Rollins, Senior Financial Analyst. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll share my screen for our presentation. Please, that would be fine. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes, okay, yep, great. We can see it, it's good. Great. So good morning, thanks for having us back again. We're here for another revenue update. The format of the presentation is uh, exactly or very consistent with what we presented to you just a couple of weeks ago. The key things that we'll focus on today is our estimates for business and IND. Um, we have also uh, reviewed April revenue and provided some small updates on some other tax types. Um, and we have included all of the tax types in this presentation, even if we just, even if we didn't make any changes so that you had everything in one place. So you can essentially take our prior presentation, put it to the side. This has everything that you need um, with contained within it. Okay. So again, just as a reminder, um, what we've done is provided an estimate for fiscal year 21. We then provide growth ranges, uh, percentage growth ranges for fiscal years 22 and 23 based on the fiscal year 21 base. The important thing to note about fiscal year 21 is we do have some anomalous receivables included in the tax types, most notably, you'll see in business taxes at 18.3 million and in the interest and dividends tax at 9.2 million. 
Um, when we provide a range of estimates for fiscal year 21, we have removed those anomalous receivables because again, they are anomalous. We do not anticipate them to occur again. So we wouldn't want to include those in the base when we're growing the base for fiscal years 22 and 23. I know we've talked about that quite a bit, but just as a reminder, um, so this first page just shows you um, a summary of where we believe fiscal year 21 will land. You see the plan numbers by tax type, the anomalous receivable amounts, a low and a high range for each tax type for fiscal year 21. Again, that is with the anomalous receivable removed. And then you'll see where that range compares to plan. As we've talked about previously, taxes are performing well, um, business taxes most notably, also the tobacco tax and the real estate transfer tax. Um, you will see that the tax most hardest hit by the pandemic, as we've discussed, has been the meals and rentals tax, um, small declines in the communication services tax and the utility property tax. So again, 20, fiscal year 21 is the base for the growth rates to be applied for fiscal years 22 and 23. And as we've done in prior presentations, we'll move through by tax types. Melissa and I will alternate with Melissa taking on more of the harder taxes. I get a little bit of an easier ride going through the presentation, but we'll alternate and we're happy to answer any questions um, at each tax type as we go through them. So Melissa, take it away with business taxes. Sure, thank you, Lindsay. Can everyone hear me okay? You bet. Perfect. Okay, so starting with business taxes, I'm going to touch on April a little bit because we just wrapped up um, our final month of returns coming in that we we're really interested to look at. April was really healthy, as I'm sure you have all seen um, in the revenue focus with business taxes ahead of plan 47.5% or 73.8 million. This is the largest April looking back for the last 10 years. With April doing so well, fiscal year to date now, we are 174.5 million or 27.5% ahead of plan. As Lindsay stated, this does include the $18.3 million of anomalous receivable, and that puts us to 252.6 million or 45.4% ahead of prior year. As we know, this pandemic has had uh, different impacts on businesses, while some really struggling and others really th thriving. Um, based on revenues, it looks like business activity for 2020 performed better than anticipating, anticipated, I think, for everyone, um, but especially for businesses. And I mean this by businesses suffered, however, it looks like the majority of our New Hampshire taxpayers fared well, actually better than they expected. Uh, I say this because as I stated, April was up 73.8 million ahead of plan. And this was primarily driven by extension payments, uh, which means taxpayers didn't pay their quarterly estimate payments, um, pay as much as they, they typically would through their quarterly estimate payments where when they ended up truing up their payment by filing their return payment or their extension payment, they actually ended up mowing, owing more than anticipated, which results in this pretty large increase uh, in April. As we know, uh, this is the largest stimulus package the federal government um, has ever infused in the economy, and this may have some, some impact on what we are seeing. Um, we know businesses and individuals obviously received more money than anticipated. Uh, with the eco economic stimulus packages being uh, a little less than 25% of GDP, so much bigger than what we've typically seen. And then this coupled with consumers having more money in their pocket and then the shifting um, economy, businesses seem to have be, re be reporting higher profits than, than, again, we could have all anticipated a year ago when we thought there were going to be some pretty drastic losses uh, in revenue. Because of this high April, we took a, a little bit different approach in how we wanted to model out the end of the year. And we did this by modeling out um, historical performance based on revenue for May and June based on March and April. So if you look at um, our low, we, we have 947.5 million or uh, excuse me, 947.5 million, which is the low point for the historic performance for revenue. And then our high we modeled using the average 
uh, historic performance, which was 964.9 million. So a pretty high range, but that's um, again, based on March and April revenue and the historic performance of that. And then for fiscal year 22 and 23, we did not change our growth rates um, that we presented to you before. So we still have a two to 6% for fiscal year 22 and a three to 5% for fiscal year 23. And again, as we stated last time we were here, those are based on um, GDP, expected GDP performances for the next couple of years. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from members of the committee? Hearing none, please continue. Okay, so on to meals and rentals tax. Uh, I'm happy to report, we actually have no updates to these ranges. April performed uh, consistent with our prior presentation. So um, we were happy to see that. It seems like we kind of are seeing a trend and um, revenue came in as expected. So um, our range for fiscal year 21, goes from the 315.4 to the 320.4. And then we have a range of five to 10% for fiscal year 22 and four to 6% for fiscal year 23. The range for 22 um, moves us closer to the fiscal year 2018 and 2018, uh, 2018 and 2019 MNR revenue. So we start to um, see that recovery and then fiscal year 23, that is more consistent with just our historic growth. So again, m and has been impacted by COVID for sure, but we anticipate a recovery in fiscal year 22, and then moving into our consistent year-over-year um, -year growth rates that we've seen historically for fiscal year 23. Pretty easy, but happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, just a, a question. Senator D. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a, that's a fairly significant range in uh, for 22, between five and 10 percent. What do you expect? The surge of pent up demand to take place? I, I think that's a great point. Um, I think there's definitely some pent up demand, uh, not only eating out but also traveling, staying in hotels again. And so, again, I think we hope that 22 will kind of be our recovery year. And then 23, we're kind of back to our normal year over year growth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Another you. Question. Thank you, Lindsay. Hearing none. Great, so for tobacco tax, we did re revise this estimate. Uh, fiscal year to date, we're 40.4 million or 24.4% ahead of plan and 34.3 million or 20% ahead of prior year. As we've spoke at length about every time we come in, we know that this increase is primarily due to the Massachusetts ban on mentholated tobacco products as well as other flavored tobacco, tobacco products. Um, one thing that we do wanna note that's a little bit different than when we came in last time is there is out there by the FDA a proposed national ban on flavored tobacco products. Um, they released that information on April 29th and it is something we will keep an eye on because if it does go into effect, it obviously will um, affect our tobacco and other tobacco product revenue. So for our low ranges, we've increased these um, between three and $5 million. We have 245.6 million. This assumes the increase due to the Massachusetts flavor ban continues at a consistent rate. Our high is 248.3 million. And again, this assumes we um, continue the 24% ahead of plan that we currently have is maintained through the end of the year. It's a little bit higher based on travel restrictions being lifted and potentially increased consumer consumption as that um, travel restriction continues to be uh, removed. Fiscal year to date for 22 and 23, again, we did not adjust these ranges when since we came in last time. We do anticipate that negative 3% to, to flat for 22, and that's because, again, this year we have now seen at the end of fiscal year 21, we've seen that full year of the Massachusetts flavor ban 
uh, sort of baked into our revenues as well as e-cigarettes. So now we're sort of getting back on trend in fiscal year 22 to sort of be flat with a negative 3% and then a, a slower decline like we've seen historically to a negative 4% to negative 1% for fiscal year 23. Happy to answer any questions on tobacco tax. Questions from the committee? I do have one question. Can you speak to the effect of the e-cigarette factor? Sure. So um, the last couple of months, it's been doing really well. Fiscal year to date, we're at about $4 million. Um, as we know, it went into effect last year. It was only a partial year when it went into effect um, last year we first started seeing revenue in February and it was about $1.2 million where this year we're really exceeding that um, again at $4 million with a couple months left. It looks like we've had a jump up in the last two months. So it's about a half a million dollars each month right now. So we probably expect to see about 5 million, I would guess in e-cigarette revenue at the end of this year, this fiscal Thank year. You. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, on to interest and dividends. Okay, interest and dividends tax. So this is one that we did not present last time. So I'll go into greater detail. At the top of the slide here, you'll see the breakdown for tax year 2018 between distributions, dividend income, interest income, and federally tax exempt interest income. This just kind of helps give some perspective because I know we the interest and dividends tax, and that's what we typically focus on, but we wanted to give the breakdown of the different components. So about almost 39% of the tax is due to distributions, 40% from dividends, 13 from interest, and almost 8% from federally exempt interest. So that, that would be um, federally tax exempt interest income is obviously interest income that's exempt at the federal level, but is taxed here at the state level. So again, although the tax begins with the word interest, um, it's really distributions and dividends that drive um, the majority of the revenue for this tax. So from the revenue focus fiscal year to date, we are 13.5 million or 13.8% ahead of plan. And we are 33.8 million or 43.7% ahead of prior year. Um, we have been performing well this year. Um, the interest and dividends tax can have some swings year over year. Um, but again, this is, uh, appears to be a strong year. The stock market continues to perform well. People have additional money in the bank, additional savings um, over the course of the pandemic for many. Um, we did want to note that the IRS did extend the individual income tax uh, due dates um, from April 15th to May 17th. Although New Hampshire did not change the due date, we did see a fewer number of returns in April. So we are anticipating revenue in May that we wouldn't normally see. And we have adjusted for that in our revenue estimates below. So for our range with the $9.2 million anomalous receivable removed, we're looking at 124 million to 132 million for fiscal year 21. The low of 124 million assumes that we remain at that 14% ahead of plan through the end of the year while also accounting for revenue shifting from April into May. The high of 132 million again assumes that revenue shift, but also assumes it will continue to see um, increased returns and extensions in May compared to 2019, um, and that our tax year 21 estimates continue on trend. Not the largest range in the world, we're only looking at about $8 million. Um, but that's how we arrived at our low and our high. For fiscal year 22, our growth range is four to 6%. This is based on past performance of the tax along with anticipated GDP. And then in fiscal year 23, we're estimating a little bit of a slowing of the growth, two to 4%, again, based on past performance of the tax um, and anticipated reduction of GDP. Um, this range has been pretty consistent. Um, over the past few months, um, again, really what April taught us was that we will expect to see revenue in May. Um, and so, like I said, we have adjusted our estimates to um, anticipate that shift in revenue from April to May. Happy to answer any questions. 
Any questions from the committee? Hearing none, press on. All right, communication services tax. This one's fairly easy. You're fairly familiar with it. It's a pretty stable tax. We did not adjust our um, revenue estimates on this one as it performed as we anticipated in April. Uh, fiscal year to date, it's basically at plan um, 100,000 or 0.3% below plan and then um, almost half a million or 1.2% ahead of prior year. Uh, this one, we pay attention to New Hampshire unemployment rates for this as if we have higher unemployment rates, taxpayers may find it more difficult to pay their uh, communication services tax resulting in some lower revenues. Also, we have taxability of video conferencing in, in the increased use of this product as the pandemic has unfolded and businesses have shifted to uh, this form of communication as well as decreased use of VoIP. So again, for our revenue estimate, which has not changed for fiscal year 21, we have 39.1 million. This um, is a loss of 2% for the remaining months of the year. And then we're flat for 22 and 23. Any questions on CST? Senator Daniels. Thank you. Uh, do you see any effect uh, of the plan on the 23rd of this month for employment security to require that people be looking for work? Um, I don't know if it would impact this tax all that much. I think obviously more people working and paying is helpful for people paying this tax. Um, we do keep an eye on it, like I did say, and we did see a dip in the beginning of the year. But I do know that although people have been unemployed, they have had some supplemental checks coming in and have been able to pay this tax as far as we can see. So um, I would think this would still be pretty steady even with that, uh, that occurring. There may be a tiny drop, but not enough, I think, for us to see an impact or change the revenue estimates. But that is a great question, Senator. For the questions. Hearing none. Real okay, transfer. moving on to the real estate transfer tax. So this has been a bit of a moving target, um, obviously a tax that has been performing well. Um, however, April performed as we anticipated. So there is no update to the range here. Um, I think we finally <laughs> have a good estimate about what's going on here. Um, so fiscal year to date, we are 28.2% ahead of plan. 21.9% ahead of prior year. Again, the real estate market is very strong. Um, as we've noted before, um, the real estate transfer tax really has two components to it. It's the volume of sales and also the price of sales. So right now, really the volume and the prices are relatively high. We have good volume um, and higher prices. There is a lot of talk about an inventory shortage really coming to fruition. So that's something that we're keeping our eye on because if the houses are not there to sell, even if they sell at higher prices, that could impact the tax. So our estimate for fiscal year 21, um, a low of 201.5, which assumes that we maintain the 28.2% that we are ahead of plan. And then our high is slightly higher at 205.7, which assumes that uh, we pick up a little bit in these last two months and we are over planned by 30%. Looking at fiscal years 22 and 23, we're seeing some right sizing kind of occurring. Like we said, um, we have high, you know, high volume of sales right now and high prices. Um, the real estate market is booming. We expect that to correct at some point. So in fiscal years 20, for fiscal year 22, we assume that the fiscal year starts with the performance that we've seen to date, but we start to shift back to kind of pre-pandemic levels. And that has us at a minus 7% to minus 2% range for 22. And then for fiscal 23, again, that continued kind of return to normalcy of the real estate market, assuming historic trends um, were maintained for fiscal years 20 to 22. So you kind of take the pandemic out of it and you just look at historically how we would have expected the real estate transfer tra tax to perform, um, that would result in a 10% to 8% loss 
in fiscal year 23. Happy to answer any questions on the real estate transfer tax. Questions from the committee? I do have a question, uh, Lindsay. And is the minus 10 and minus eight for 23, is that below 22 or below 21? So that would be a change, the minus 10 and minus 8%, you would apply that to fiscal year 22. Okay. That's and when we get to the end, you can see, I'll show you where you can see that at the end, how that compares to the three years. All right, further questions? All right, utility property tax. All right, utility property tax. This is one that we did adjust our estimate. Uh, fiscal year to date, we're 2.6 million or 7.8% below plan and 1.8 million or 5.6 below prior year. Um, you may note that this is lower than when we reported to you last month. And that is because we did see a decline in revenue in April. Uh, this was because I'm not sure if you know how the utility property tax works, but essentially taxpayers make quarterly estimate payments based on a prior year's assessment. And then come January, they true up those payments based on current year assessment. And if there's any difference, it may affect future payments. So in this situation, when they trued up their return in January, their valuations had decreased, leaving them with overpayments or credits on file. They then utilize those credits um, on their April estimate However, we don't, we anticipate that they utilized all of those credits in April and that we'll see um, June be similar to what we anticipated, which was about 10% um, below plan based on valuations being 10% below their prior year valuations. Um, this, although the valuations went down, this property tax does not appear to be affected by um, COVID-19 at this point. Our new fiscal year 21 range, or we don't have a range, actually our number would be 40.6 million. And then we do anticipate this being flat for 22 and 23. Happy to answer any questions on UPT. Questions from the committee? Hearing none. Okay, so the last two slides at the end of the presentation just provide a summary, um, kind of one-stop shop for everything that we've presented this morning. So on page nine, you will see a summary by tax type with our fiscal year 21 ranges, low to high, and then our 22 and 23 growth ranges. Um, again, this is just a summary of everything that you've seen on the individual slides, kind of a one-stop shop to, um, to see how this all kind of fits together. And then on the last slide, um, we have provided by tax type, the fiscal year 20 audited revenue amounts, fiscal year 21 plan. And then we kind of summarize the governor, the house and our DRA ranges. You'll see that obviously the governor and the house numbers were done with before data before March and April. Um, and then our new high and low ranges for 21 and the growth ranges for 22 and 23, we incorporate um, data through April. So Senator, or uh, for your question about the real estate transfer tax, you'll see that our range for fiscal year 21 is 201.5 to 205.7. When you provide, when you apply those negative two to negative 7% ranges for 22, you get a range of 187.4 to 201.6. So we do anticipate a decline. And then when you apply the negative eight to negative 10% range for 23, you come to 167.8 to 185.5. And again, that 167.8 and 185.5, that's essentially where we would expect the real estate transfer tax to be based on historic growth rates without this significant bump that we've seen over the past. Kind of trended out the real estate transfer tax, ignored the impact of COVID and the real estate bump we've seen, that's where you would have ended in 23. Any questions from the committee? Questions. Senator Rosewald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if a DRA has any updated projections on the cost of Senate Bill 13 
I think the last thing we saw from you was $91 million over this fiscal year and the next two. Is that still your thinking or have you refined it? Um, my anticipation, Senator Rosenwald, was that if the chair would like, we'd be happy to come back and talk about some of the specific revenue impacts for not only what was in HB2 coming out of the House, what's in the surplus statement, but any other bills um, to give you an update and a better you know, um, summary of the estimated impacts for you to take those into account. So we're happy to come back um, oh, and do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? I would be, uh, I would support uh, DRE's return as the commissioner has indicated to talk about House Bill 2 uh, from the House. Of course, that will help us maybe make some changes relative to House Bill 2 as we work through it in the Senate. So uh, commissioner, should I have Sonia give you a call? Sure, certainly we would be happy to do that. All right, thank you. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Any further comments from the commissioner and staff? Nope, happy to answer any questions. Happy to be here today. Revenues are always a fun topic. All right, thank you once again. Uh, and we'll see you again, I'm sure. So uh, we'll thank have uh, Sonia give you thank a buzz you. on, on uh, what, what we discussed earlier. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I believe that concludes our business today. Let me. Senator, we have to exec. Yeah, let me get to my calendar here. All right. So we'll we'll take a movement to go a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. Moved by Daniel, second by Hennessy. All in favor? Well, let's do it. Senator Rosenwald, Senator Daniels, yes. Senator Hennessy, yes. Senator Guide, yes. Do we want to wait for Senator D'Alessandro to return? I think that would be appropriate. He said he had a prime bill. So we can take a recess. Can we recess from executive session? Yeah, well, let's do, let's do a, a, a five minute recess uh, awaiting the return of Senator D'Alessandro from testifying on his prime bill. And mute your mics.
committee will come out of recess. And we're in executive session and um, Senator Rosenwald for motion. Good morning. Um, if it's appropriate, I would like to make a motion on House Bill 15 of ought to pass. All right, ought to pass by Senator Rosenwald. Is there a second? Senator, Senator Hennessy seconds. And now we're open for discussion. May I? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I've been all over uh, the website for Turo. And um, part of what they're really doing is advertising car rentals, not just for individuals, but for people who want to have a fleet of cars. And they're um, expressing that with nine cars, the average annual income is almost $95,000 a year. So while I find the technology of the platform may be newer, I, I believe that they are advertising for car rentals. And on the lodging side, I'm comforted by the fact that Airbnb is already doing what this bill requires and taking on the liability for the individual homeowners that are renting out their homes or, or parts of their homes. So I know we like to avoid government picking winners and losers. And I think this bill does it it's, to me as a matter of fairness. And, and that's why my motion. Thank you. Okay, further discussion. All right, hearing none, you ready for the vote. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator D'Alessandro. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Daniels. No. And Senator Guida will vote yes. Four to one, um, we will take the bill. Who wants to take the bill out? Senator Rosenwald. If you okay. would like me to, I'm happy to. All right. Thank you. All right, so we'll look to exec on uh, House Bill 154. Is there a motion? I Senator D'Alessandro moves off to pass. Senator Hennessy seconds. Any discussion? All right, hearing none. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take the vote. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator D'Alessandro? Yes. Senator Daniels? Yes. And Senator Guida votes yes. 5 0. Consent? Yes. So moved. Okay, moved by, uh, um, yeah, Rosenwald, second Senator. by D'Alessandro. Uh, Senator Rosenwald? Yes. Senator Daniels? Yes. Senator D'Alessandro? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Guida votes yes. I think that concludes our work for the day. Um, who wants to take that out? I'll take okay. Lou, Aaron. All I'm right, happy. I'll take I'll take it out. Sorry. Yeah. Further discussion. How about a motion to come out of exec? So moved by D'Alessandro, seconded by Hennessy. Senator De Rosenwald? Yes. Senator Daniels? Yes. Senator D'Alessandro? Yes. Senator Hennessy? Yes. Senator Guida votes yes. Motion to adjourn? So moved. By Hennessy, second by Daniels. Senator Rosenwald? Yes. Senator Daniels?